line that rep it represents a section of a chromosome, or it could be a whole chromosome, and we have four sites that have genotypes. The genotypes are just pairs of alleles, and they're listed on the slide. Those alleles were inherited from a mother and a father, and as a sequence of alleles from the mother and a sequence of alleles from the father. And genotype phasing, what's sometimes called haplotype phasing, is uses statistical methods to estimate what those sequences of alleles were that were inherited from each parent. So for example, you might estimate that the sequences are shown on the bottom two lines of the slide here. And if you look at each site, you can see you still have the same pairs of alleles. You haven't lost any information. Like at the first site, the two uh, lines at the bottom have an A and G, and that matches the genotype on the top site. But now they're resolved into two sequences. One would be inherited from the mother and the other sequence from the father. Why are we interested in haplotypes? Well, there's a haplotypes unlock the door to a whole host of analyses that you can do. And they tend to be more powerful than genotypic analysis in many cases. Their haplotypes are more informative than genotypes. You still have the same information you had in the genotypes because you have two haplotypes, so you know the two alleles at each site that you've genotyped. So you haven't lost the genotype information, but you've gained the information about how those alleles were transmitted from the parents. And that has uh, gives you the ability to do some things computationally and statistically that are very difficult to do with unfazed genotypes. Some examples, uh, the biggest example, the one most people are most familiar with would be genotype amputation, where we infer missing genotypes, sporadic missing genotypes, or even ungenotyped markers in our in our sample, but you could also infer local ancestry if you have an admixed individual. You could, for a particular allele, infer what continental origin that allele had. You can detect identity by descent segments, which are sections of DNA that two individuals have inherited uh, intact from a recent common ancestor. Ancestral recombination graphs is inferring those as another application. And I, at this point, I didn't want to make the slide too busy, but you can go on. You can do include selection. You can include inference of recent demography and uh, bottlenecks in the population in recent generations. There's all these applications are made possible if you have the haplotypes. So that's that's why we're interested in why haplotypes are a very valuable thing to have for genetic analysis. So we recently published a paper, this came out in the January issue of the American Journal of Human Genetics, describing a phasing pi pipeline for the first release of UK Biobank sequence data, uh, 150,000 individuals. After we did this work, the UK Biobank released an expanded set of sequence data with 200,000 individuals. So most of this talk will relate to the 200,000 individuals. We use the same pipeline. Essentially, we just changed the names or the path names for the input files to change them from the 150,000 sample set to the 200,000 sample set. And we reran it to get uh, phasing for them. The PubMed identifier for the paper showing on the bottom left of the screen, the uh, pipeline itself is a GitHub repository. It's showing on the bottom right of the screen. The paper is available as a preprint and in July, about the time the it, the data is scheduled for the 200,000 samples to be available on the wrap. The, uh, this paper will be come out from behind the paywall, and you can actually access the published version at that point. But this is a screenshot of the, of the readme file in the GitHub repository. And our primary goal in designing the pipeline was to design something that was simple for us and other people to use. And you can see a hint of that in the contents. The contents are fairly sparse. There's some issues to think about before starting. You have to make sure you have tier three access, so you have access to the sequence data. You have to have an account on the UK Biobank RAP. You have to ensure that your, your spending limit will allow you to do the analysis because it will cost a few thousand pounds. But that's a few preliminaries. Then you upload the resources of the cloud, the resources here are just genetic maps for each chromosome and five DNA nexus applets. We'll talk more about those on the later slide. And then you run a command to phase the genome. One thing that I really 
was pleased at the end of this study to see is how reproducible the work was when you're working on the cloud and with the tools that DNA Nexus provides. So if you want to re reproduce the exact same genomes, the exact same phasing as we produced, four commands will do the job. The first is just a Git clone to pull down that repository to your local machine, from GitHub to your local machine. That takes about five seconds. Change next command just changes directory. These are Unix commands. Change directory into the repository that you've downloaded. The third command, upload.resources, uploads the genetic maps and the uh, applets, the five applets, into a project that you specify. Here we use a project called demo for demonstration, but you would replace demo with your project name. You would, you need to have, have a project set up where you've dispensed UK Biobank data to the project. And then the last command is a bash for loop. X here, 4X, X is the loop variable, and it goes through one, two, three, up through 22, which are the 22 chromosome identifiers, and then X, because it also will phase X. And for each chromosome, it runs the command phase.ukb, and it follows that by whatever project you're working in, which in this case, we, we're using a project named demo. And the dollar sign X in that last line is just the value of the loop variable. So you run this phase.ukb command once for every chromosome. That's it. Four commands, you exactly reproduce the phasing. So we tried to make it as straightforward and simple to use as possible. Because one of the values of simplicity is it makes it easy for other people to start modifying and tinkering with things if they want to. And there was one area that we could see in advance, other research groups very, very likely would want to change and modify for their purposes. And that's the variant filtering. So in addition to having a simple pipeline, uh, another design goal we had was to produce a very accurate phasing. And phase accuracy increases as your genotype accuracy increases. So we applied very stringent filters so that the phase data we produced would be able to be applied to a wide spectrum of haplotypic analysis because it was very high accurate, had very high accuracy. But other groups, they may not be interested in, in a broad spectrum of phasing analysis. They might have a particular haplotype analysis in mind, and they may be able to, they may, may not need as much, as high as accuracy as, as we designed our filtering to provide. And they may want to include structural variants. So this is the screen you're seeing now is another screenshot from a farther down that readme file that just describes how you can change the filtering if you want to have a different set of filtering, in this case, to include structural variants. And it's just one line that needs change. You don't have to make changes all throughout the phasing pipeline. It's just one line of one file. We tell you exactly where it is, what file it's in. And you were change this uh, filtering expression. The very well-known software BCF tools is used for filtering. And what this slide shows is a filtering expression used by VCF tools, and you can modify that to do whatever phasing you want. We also included extra, we didn't, we, we chose a configuration, machine configuration, so that you should be able to change the filtering without having to alter other parts of the pipeline. We left enough headroom in, in, the, in the compute nodes we use so that you can change the filtering, include more markers if you wish to do that. And you should, in most cases, you should not, in reasonable cases, I think you should not need to change the machines, the, the capabilities of the machines that the pipeline is running on. So here is a, is a slide taken from the paper that phased the first release of 150,000 genomes, where you can see uh, a little bit about what the costs are. The 150,000 genomes you can see in the total line was about 2,300 British pounds. I, the, the cost for phasing the 200,000 genomes was about 3,300 British pounds. So the scaling is a little bit higher than linear, but you're also, the larger number of genomes will typically include more variants. So you are phasing more variants. And the first column on the task just describes the different applets. And I'll just briefly describe how the phasing pipeline works by looking at the task column. 
The first is, is an applet that orchestrates analysis. And these applets, if you're not familiar with them, they're just, they're wrappers that go around programs, a bash script or some kind of executable that take care of the extra work that needs done when you're running analyses on the cloud. So these applets, in addition to running the program, they will bring in imp uh, input files from cloud storage onto the machine. They will spin up a compute node. They will transfer files into the compute node before the analysis and get it set up. They will install software on your, the software you need on your compute node. And then after the analysis is done, they will transfer the data back uh, to cloud storage. They take care of all that extra work that needs done when running analyses on the cloud. So the orchestrator analysis is like the uh, conductor of a symphony. It makes sure that each task runs and is completed before the next task begins. And the first uh, applet that orchestrator analysis calls is one that filters the markers. And this is a little bit more complicated than uh, you may be familiar with because the data, the input data, because it's so large, is split in the genome among around 60,000 files. Each of these files has uh, sequence data for about a 50 kilobase region of the genome. And, and so you can filter these files in parallel, and then you have to, uh, you know, you'll have to paste them together to create larger files. So the filtering step runs, and then the files get concatenated. That's actually pretty cheap because the way we handle the filtering is we produce some gzip files so that all that we have to do is paste those gzip files together using the cat, uh, the Unix cat command. And the key point here is that we don't have to decompress and uh, recompress the data to, to concatenate the files. Then, and the, then the next uh, applet begins that phases the genotypes, and that's where the heavy lifting is done. Most of the cost is incurred in the phasing of the genotype stage. And the last step is Tabix is used to phase or to index the phase BCF files. Most of these instances, uh, or much of the work runs on spot instances, which are instances that can be interrupted if, the, if that capacity is needed by other users on the compute cloud. We're using uh, DNA Nexus's normal priority when we run on spot instances, which means if a spot instance fails, it will automatically be rerun on an on-demand instance, an on-demand instance that will not, that cannot be interrupted. The only time this you might see in our experience going over to, to an on-demand instance is in the filtering jobs. So in, in a worst case scenario, if everything went wrong in the Compute Cloud was very busy and all your spot jobs failed when you were filtering markers, that cost for filtering markers could increase by a factor of five. But again, that's a worst case scenario. We did not experience that. Our cost was just about 300 pounds to perform the marker filtering. Just to give you an example of what the monitoring screen on the UK Biobank ramp looks like. So this is what the monitoring screen, a screenshot of the monitoring screen 15 minutes after running the command to phase chromosome 21 in project demo. If you look at the bottom line, that's the orchestrator program. It, it spins up first, and it's been running for about 15 minutes. And then it starts calling jobs to filter all the files that contain data for a chromosome. The first, the, if you look at the second to the bottom line, you'll see filter.c21. C21 is the chromosome, chromosome 21. Dot B, it tells you uh, what blocks, or in other words, what files you're, you're uh, filtering on the chromosome. The first one is just block zero. From block, the first number is the beginning block. The second is the ending block. The first block is handled by itself because it contains a BCF header and it has some special treatment. Then after that, we're doing 100 files at a time for filtering. So the next line is blocks one through 100. And if you can see that as you go up, you have another set of 100 blocks that gets filtered. All these jobs are started by the orchestrator program. If you're looking at when the job started and their duration, you can see that we're uh, sort of uh, limiting how fast jobs go to the cluster. Our concern is that we don't want to just dump a huge amount of computation in the cluster where we can't run them as spot jobs, as preemptible instances anymore. 
So we limit how fast we submit jobs to the cluster so that there's less likely that we'll, you know, put too much work on the cluster to where we can't run them as, as on preemptible or, or spot instances. The last part of the talk is I just want to look at switch errors so you get a sense of what kind of accuracy you can expect in sequence data of this size. And switch error is, is the most common way of measuring errors in phase data. So if you have two markers, two heterozygous genotypes, for simplicity, we'll call the two alleles, the two different alleles at each marker, A and B. For example, A could be the reference allele and B, an alternate allele. And there's two ways those two heterozygous genotypes can be phased. You know, in other words, there's two ways that we can infer that the data was transferred, passed down from the parents. On the left-hand side, the A alleles are both on the same haplotype or on the same line. On the right-hand side, the A alleles are on different haplotypes or different lines. So one of those is correct, one's wrong. If when we phase, if we get it wrong, if we choose the wrong case, it's called a switch error. So switch errors occur when going from one marker to the next. And those switch errors come in two flavors. So this, we've on the left-hand side of the slide, we have the true phase where we've each column represents a haplotype inherited from a parent, and they're color coded to make it visually clear where the switch errors are. So the orange uh, boxes are inherited from one parent, the blue boxes are inherited from the other parent, and we're only looking at heterozygote markers. That's why each, each marker has an orange and a blue box. And the first type of switch error you can get is what I'd call a single switch error. This terminology of single and double switches is not. Standard, many groups have noticed this behavior, but I don't think there's been a single terminology that, that we all commonly use. So I'm using these terms because I think they're, they're very descriptive of what's going on. And in the single switch error case, we've inferred the phase, and you can see there's a switch error between markers three and four. In the single switch error, you see that in the, in the first column, you should go from an, a marker three from an orange to an orange box at the fourth marker, but instead we go from orange to blue. There's a switch error, and your eyes can pick this up immediately. And the other type of switch error that occurs is a double switch error, where you have two switch errors back to back. So in the double switch error case, just like in the single switch error case in this example, there is a switch error between markers three and four, between the third and fourth heterozygote, because you can see within a column that the color changes. It goes from orange to blue, orange at marker three to blue at marker four. But then it's immediately followed by another switch error. Going from four to five, we again, the color changes, blue to orange. And the first time you see this, it may seem strange. Why would you have two switch errors back to back like that? Well, these switch errors aren't so occurring randomly here. What's happened is there's a single heterozygous genotype that there's no information or not enough information to phase it accurately. All the other markers around it, you can phase accurately, but there's one that there's, there's a lack of information. The phasing program essentially has to guess. It might use some heuristics to help a little bit, but it's essentially having to guess, and it guesses wrong. So that's how double switch errors can occur. It's probably best not to think of them as two, two errors. It's really one error caused by one marker, but it shows up as two switch errors. Now, it turns out that double switch errors in large data are the predominant error mode. Double switch errors are what you see most of in sequence data like the UK Biobank. Generally, over 90% of the switch errors you see will be double switch errors. That's the primary dominant error mode, which is good because it turns out double switch errors are preferable to single switch errors. And you might, at first, that's counterintuitive. Why would two switch errors be better than one switch error? Well, the double switch error case is better because anytime you have two heterozygous genotypes separated by a double switch error, they're correctly phased. So, for example, just look at the first, I blanked out everything except the first and eighth markers. And you can see in the double switch error cases, the blues are in the same column. They're correctly phased. But in the single switch error case, because there's only one switch error, they get switched and they never switch back. And so in the single switch error case, they're incorrectly phased. So double switch errors, even though there's two switch errors, that's what you prefer to have because anytime you have two heterozygous genotypes separated by a double switch error, they will be correctly phased but that's not true in the single switch error case. 
So I'm, may, I'm mentioning this sort of way to look at the two kind, major kinds of switch errors, because that's, we use these, take these into account when we're measuring accuracy. So one of the accuracy measurements we look at is how long are the stretches of accurately, completely accurate phasing? How many megabases do we, are they on average? So we're going from one phase error, which could be a single or a double switch error, to the next phase error, which could be a single or a double switch error. How long is the stretch where you get it right? And another uh, measure we look at is what's the difference, what's the distance between single switch errors? Right, those are the ones we really want to avoid if we can. How far apart on average are single switch errors? The farther apart they are, the better. So here's some data from the results from chromosome 20 with the 200,000 uh, individuals. We used trio, parent offspring trios to get a true phasing in the trio offspring. So we used parental genotypes to infer what the true phase in is in the child. Then we excluded the parental genotypes from the statistical phasing. So statistical phasing did not see the parental genotypes at all. And we looked at how the statistical phasing of the offspring compared with the phasing we got when we took it from, inferred it from the parental genotypes. Excuse me. And the switch error rate here was about 0.16%. This is in the white British trio offspring. This is in trios where all three members were classified by the UK Biobank as white British which is the majority of individuals in the UK Biobank. So we're going stretches uh, of 500 genotypes or 500 heterozygous, heterozygous genotypes at a time, more than that between switch errors on average. That's fairly accurate. The megabases between phase errors, which is you know how far in terms of megabases do we go between one error and another, either a single switch error, or double switch error, and the next single or double switch error, and that's around 2.3 megabases, so pretty good. That's good enough for most haplotype analysis that you would want to do. And those pernicious single switch errors, we're going 20 megabases between single switch errors, so those fortunately are not cropping up very often, which is what we want. Now, this is with the filtering that is provided by the pipeline, which generates 9.9 .9 million markers on chromosome 20. Uh, after this filtering. If you need a bit more accuracy on phasing, you can get that by excluding the very lowest frequency markers. So I've added another column where we've excluded markers whose minor allele frequency is less than 0 0.001. And a case where you would probably want to do this is if you're detecting segments of identity by descent. Identity by descent segment detection is very sensitive to haplotype error. You want long stretches of accurate haplotypes. And it's not that sensitive to inclusion of low frequency markers. So you could, after phasing, you could filter and exclude markers with uh, MAF below 0.1%. And you end up with 310,000 markers after that. So you've gotten rid of a lot of markers, but it's still very dense. It's a, in chromosome 20, this is five higher frequency markers per minute. Per kilobase, one every 200 base pairs on average, approximately. And here you can see the switch error rate drops by about a factor of four to less to around 0.04%. The megabases between phase errors, which is the distance you're getting the phasing completely right on average between errors, is almost up to eight megabases. And the distance between single switch errors increases to 20, near 27 megabases on average. The should be emphasized that this is for the white British, the majority uh, of the UK biobank data. If you look at the at, uh, accuracy in trios where at least one member of the trio is not classified as white British by the UK biobank, the accuracy drops, but perhaps not as much as one might expect, given the much smaller sample size and the much greater genetic uh, diversity in the, in the individuals who are not white British. And if you compare the switch error rates, you'll see that the switch error rates are going up by approximately a factor of three. This would still be uh, allow you to do many haplotype-based analyses, but you need to be aware that uh, there is this difference in accuracy depending on what the ancestry is of the individual you're phasing, just primarily due to the sample size and the different degree of genetic diversity there is. Well, 
very much thank you for this opportunity to present this work. I want to acknowledge my collaborator, primary collaborator, Sharon Browning, uh, my funders at the NIH and HDRI, the UK Biobank uh, for providing the data and DNA Nexus for providing the platform. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you so much. Uh, now I think it's time for the Q&A. We got two questions in the chat uh, from Saliha. Saliha, do you want to ask your question directly? Yes, all right. Um, hi everyone, thank you for the presentation, Brian, it was very interesting. Uh, we have a um, specific case scenario where we want to, we have identified individuals who have to hit in a gene of interest. And I was wondering if we can phase uh, a subset of this interval just around the gene of interest, but they are actually rare variant because it is for genetic diagnosis purpose or something similar. And it is very difficult in the absence of parents. So I'm trying to figure out the best um, procedure here so that we maximize the results. So yes, you can do that. There's a, you would modify the pipeline slightly. You would add a, an argument to the command that runs Beagle, a parameter named Chrome that allows you to restrict the analysis to a certain region. Uh, I would recommend including a decent amount of, uh, of the chromosome on each side of your region of interest. Probably 500 KB would be enough, if, uh, but you could go more. So include your region of interest, include a buffer region of perhaps a half a megabase on each side, put that in a Chrome command, and then uh, you could run the pipeline. You also, I guess, need to, you could save yourself some money by uh, adjusting what files go into the filtering. You, if you wanna save some money, you could just filter the files in that region but that requires a, a bit more modification of the, pi of the pipeline. If and you're interested, you have, go ahead. I'm sorry, would you have a sense of how reliable is the rare variant phasing? Well, you, you can get a little bit of a sense of it in, uh, in, in the data I showed on accuracy and how the accuracy changed as you, as, you reduce, as you reduce that. I don't know how rare you're talking about. Are we talking about something that's unique to a family? Uh, this is the extremely rare variant because they lead to a disease of interest. So I want to know if they are in cis or in trans, because then you don't, uh, since it's a recessive disorder, you want to know if um, they actually have compound letters I got or they are in cis, so they're not relevant and we need to look for a second hit. So it's a pretty complicated scenario. Well, the confidence you have will depend on the frequency. If it's If this variant has seen only one individual, then we cannot face you it. have no confidence. If it's seen in five to ten individuals, there's a much, you know, the confidence goes up. I'd, I'd hate to speculate, but you know, I would think you would be getting it phase accurately, you know, 95 to 99 percent of the time. It's just my guess, you know, if if you if this variant is occurring in 10 individuals. And you would you would of course you would you keep the relatives and maximize the cohort even if the subset of the cohort is the you interested in like two hundred. You, you definitely want to keep the relatives, and yes. and you uh, would like to include as many samples as you can in the phasing. Phasing accuracy goes up with sample size. That's thank you. That's very very helpful. And you were going to suggest something before I cut you off. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I've lost my train of thought on that, but that's if it, if it comes back to me, I'll. I'll, I'll <laughs> I'm sorry, I. I no, that's fine. Good. Thank you. Yeah. All right. We also have question from uh, Bastian. Yes. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. It was very uh, relevant to the work I'm doing, and um, I had a question regarding the uh, another pipeline that has been published last year called the Shape It. Uh, shape it five, and in my case, I'm interested in um, rare variants with less than 0.1 percent in minor allele frequency in the UK Biobank um, from uh, the exome sequencing data. And I'm I, I was just wondering if you would recommend using uh, that tool, or or if your statistical phasing would be better um, to accomplish that that task of um, phasing. Uh, rare variants from the exome. Thank you. 
Uh, I, I have not done any work looking at accuracy for exome. If you'd phase the, the exonic variants, you would want to include the SNP array as a backbone for that, or your phase, that would, but I have not looked at that myself, so I, I can't really speak on it. Uh, yeah, all right, all right. Tool. Thanks, you. Thanks. And so I appropriately shaped it. Pike uses that, um, yeah. the, the, the haplotypes as a, as a scaffold. Yeah. So, yeah. so you would recommend that. That would be a fine approach to take. Okay. It's a, shape is a very good tool. Thanks. Thanks very much. All right. And we have a question from Jason Chin. Uh, Jason, do you want to ask question directly? Hi, great talk. And uh, I think my question I already put in the chat box. Um, there are some regions in human genome that, you know, uh, those segmental duplication region, the structure is very complicated. And uh, so the variant calling may not be so reliable. Does your filtering, filtering step uh, actually filter out those? And um, it is if it's got filtered out, do you have some idea how to do the best phasing for those regions? Uh, in the future or something like that. So the, the filtering in the published pipeline filters out anything that's not a single nucleotide variant, right? The, the GitHub repository gives him instructions of how you can include the structural variants in the phasing. Mm -hmm. So it just changes one line and you could do redo the phasing and include structural variants. Uh, essentially, we've had pretty good results with structural variants by just treating them as if they're a single nucleotide variant. You phase them the same way as anything else. We've had pretty good results with that, but with the caveat, the structural variants are harder to genotype correctly. They have a higher genotypic error rate, and that means that your phasing will, will be less accurate as structural variants because of the higher genotype error rate. And on top of that, uh, they will also lower the accuracy at, at other more better genotype variants like SNIS. So if you include lower quality variants, in your phasing, it will also detract from your accuracy at markers like SNPs than you could get if you had excluded the more uh, the structural variants. Is that clear? Did I express myself? Uh, I think that's, uh, that's that's great. Yeah, I, I, I think now I think about that. You start from the VCA file. So if uh, the there are some repeat region, the read doesn't have good QV, the, the variant won't be cold, right? So you won't be able to see those. Right. If if the variant isn't in the published BCF files, then yeah, we will never see it. Okay, all right. And we won't the phasing won't see it either if it's filtered out in the in the filtering step. Yeah, thanks a lot. I like your tool. Yeah. We have uh, one more question from Dioko. Uh, all right, I can I can ask uh for Dioko. So uh, how about the uh, does the phasing uh, pipeline handle chromosome X? Yeah, it, ha it handles chromosome X. Uh, essentially what it does internally, it's it's not ideal, but it's good enough. Is it, uh, if it detects a, a haploid, actually, I think the, my memory is the input data codes male chromosome X samples as homozygous diploid genotypes. That's my memory. If it doesn't, then Beagle will automatically trans convert them into homozygous diploid genotypes during, during the phasing. Uh, so that, that's how it handles chromosome X. That's, uh, for most purposes, that, that will do well. It's not the absolute perfect way of handling it, but it's good enough for most analyses. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, is there any question from the audience? All right, any question from the DNA uh, scientist? I think all my questions were actually uh, answered during the talk and through other people's questions, but I just wanted to share a comment that uh, I really enjoyed the talk and it's a really exciting tool. It's definitely also something that's very uh, impressive to see um, something that's so nice and so portable. I know it's quite difficult to kind of uh, generate these kind of pipelines and not only that, but kind of make it into something that's shareable with the community. And so I think that's really exciting. So looking forward to kind of seeing what researchers are able to accomplish with it. 